You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. What the heck is going on with the U.S. economy? Some of the best forecasters and the most accurate people have been completely wrong these past few years. Granted, these past few years have been anything but normal, but today's interview might give some insight on all of this. I'm Kathy Fedke, and welcome to The Real Well Show. Rick Sharga is our guest today. He's been on before, and he also just co-hosted my annual housing forecast, which you can find at realwellshow.com under the Learn tab. You don't want to miss that and see all his very cool slides. But he's also here today to talk about the newest economic reports that just keep dumbfounding the experts, but in a good way. Rick, welcome back to The Real Well Show. Great to be here, Kathy. Hope, hope the year's off to a good start for you. Yeah, I was going to say another year, another economic cycle. Where are we now? What's going on in, in the U.S. economy? It keeps going by so quickly, doesn't it? It's, it's Valentine's Day in two weeks. That's a shout out to the guys. Make sure you don't forget. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's an interesting economic cycle to be sure. It keeps confounding the economists. Uh, we just had Q4, um, the, the early projections in for the economy for the GDP came in at 3.3% growth, which was almost a point and a half higher than economists had forecast. Uh, and in economic terms, that terms that's a big miss. Uh, the consumer continues to be really, really resilient, spending lots and lots of money. Uh, so the, the notion that this was just all pent up demand from COVID, uh, probably probably not true. So we see wage growth going up and and consumers are are happy to spend the money that they're they're taking home. And a lot of them are taking home money because unemployment is still very low. We're, we're looking at I think the most recent unemployment rates were about 3.8%. Historically speaking, anything under 5% is considered full employment. So we're really getting spoiled by these unemployment numbers. And there's still about 8.8 .8 million jobs open uh, looking for workers. And there's only about 6 million workers looking for jobs. So it's uh, it's a, a really tight market if you're an employer. Um, you have to compete to keep your employees. You have to compete to bring in new ones. That's what's driving wage growth up. So, you know, d despite everything the Federal Reserve is doing, and I suspect we'll talk a little bit about that, um, the economy continues to go uh, to go great guns. <laughs> well, I can tell you exactly why consumers are spending, because Cyber Monday is now uh, all Black Friday. It's all weekend. The deals were incredible. I couldn't, I had trigger finger problems. I couldn't <laughs> stop clicking on things that I didn't need or really want. Anyway, could be, could be my fault par partially. And, and many others who got, who got swept into that, it's, but it's it a, is so a, easy to a, buy stuff now. I wonder if that has much to do with it. It's a first world problem for sure, Kathy. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so it is amazing that some of the best economists and some of the most accurate forecasters were absolutely wrong last year because mm -hmm. there was pretty much a lot of consensus that the recession would be in 2023, right? Yep. Yeah, there was it, at one point last year, there was about an 83% certainty among economists that we were going to see a recession last year. That's down to about 50% this year, um, it may be a little bit below 50%. Uh, and, and it could be that the Federal Reserve is going to uh, to get the balancing act right and, and just narrowly avoid uh, a recession. Now, having said that, um, you look at the global economy, and, and it's a little bit of a different scenario. Europe just barely stayed out of recession territory, so all the countries that are on the euro – uh, the, the growth rate for their fourth quarter was 0.1%. Uh, and that, that's coming off uh, a quarter where they were actually in negative territory. The UK projected gr growth this year is 0.2% for, for all year. Uh, Canada may already be in a recession. China, China's economy is slowing down and, and having some real issues. So in, in light of what could be a global recession, uh, it would be unusual for the U.S. to avoid one. Uh, and, and even if we do, likelihood is that, that economic growth will at least slow down as we go through this year. Um, and th there are a couple of red flags in the consumer spending. Uh, you, you mentioned how easy it is to spend money, uh, particularly using credit cards. And, and consumer data shows you're 110% right. 
Uh, the third quarter of last year was the first time in history that credit card debt in the U.S. exceeded a trillion dollars. That's a big number. Uh, and that happened while interest rates on credit cards were going through the roof. I think the average interest rate on a new card issued in the third quarter was 25 percent. Uh, I'm seeing I'm seeing uh, credit card companies with interest rates of 30 and 31 percent right now, which in my mind should probably be illegal. It feels like usury. Uh, oh, absolutely. But, but you look at what consumers are, you look at how much consumers are putting on their credit cards and either they're just crazy happy to spend or, uh, and here's the potential uh, problem, they're using those credit cards to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're still in a fairly high cost of living environment. I, I don't know if I've ever told you about my cost co-price index. <laughs> no, you have not. <laughs> so there, there's the CPI that the government puts out, and I, I think it's full of holes. Um, mm -hmm. So I've created my own CPI, which is the Costco price index. And, and I look at the price of salmon. So I buy my salmon from Costco. And a year ago, that salmon was $9.99 a pound. Uh, this year, it was at $12.99 a pound. And that's not a 3% or 9% inflation rate. That's a 30% bump. Uh, and I think that's what a lot of households have faced over the last year is the reality that that necessities like food, like gasoline, like energy costs have really gone up considerably more than the overall rate of inflation has. Uh, and and hopefully that doesn't mean that they're they're buying all their necessities on credit cards with 25 percent interest rates or that they're tapping into their savings because personal savings rates are at an almost all time low as well. So we do watch those as red flags. The good news, by the way, is last week at Costco, uh, the salmon was down to $11.99 a pound. So we, we are seeing a, a bit of a recovery and good news for all you salmon eaters out there. Good to know. I will visit Costco soon then. <laughs> Look for that. They have I great uh, CPAs. I getting endorsement fees from Costco for this, but that, it, be that as it may. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love this. Okay. So, you know, again, coming back to this confusing economy and everybody sort of waiting for this recession to come that's just not coming and the GDP numbers just coming out being so, so strong what's fueling that? I mean, does it, does it have to do with so much of the government stimulus, so, so much of the money floating around that was created over the last few years? I think that started it, Kathy. Uh, one economist that I, I know pretty well said that the, the second stimulus program was overkill, uh, mm -hmm. probably wasn't needed. And, and in fact, if you look at the, the COVID program in general, uh, the way he characterized it was the government was trying to fill a three trillion dollar hole with fifteen trillion dollars, uh, so they, they overstimulated and we doubled the monetary supply. and And when you do that, you get inflation, uh, and you get a lot of spending. Uh, and then you had supply chain disruption, which meant people were trying to buy things um, that that weren't available, and so the sellers jacked the prices up. That mm -hmm. was also true in the service industry. You probably know that from working with contractors across the country. Um, so supplies went, went through the roof. Now, all, all that seems to have settled down quite a bit. <clears throat> I think that started the, the wave. But right now, I think what we're really dealing with is just uh, consumers who are making more money. They're, the wage growth is about 5% a year right now. The average hourly rate in the country is, all, is over $29 an hour. Uh, and people are using that 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 money to go buy things or or to travel or to to buy services, um, and 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 there's a little bit of a rebound from not being able to spend money for a while, but uh, it really doesn't show any signs of slowing down appreciably. Even even the the es the experts who talked about retail spending, you know, going in the in the tank in the fourth quarter were, were wrong, went up a, a couple percent by itself. So I I the do I see it slowing down? Probably. Uh, do I see it slowing down enough that on its own it will lead us into a recession? Probably not. Um, the, the consumer accounts for 70 percent of the GDP. And as long as the spending is there, the, the, the GDP will be pretty strong. Uh, you'll continue to see hiring. You'll continue to see wages go up. So while I do think we may still see a recession this year, because I think the Fed has probably actually overcorrected in order to get inflation under control, if we have one, uh, it'll be very short, it'll be very mild, and a lot of people won't even notice it's here, except that the press will be jumping up and down saying, see, see, recession. <laughs> 
Well, I've been in t- taking advantage of the fear that's been in the air and, you know, and investing like crazy with our yep. single family rental fund. You know, we kept hearing people say, yeah, but when the recession hits, people are going to lose their jobs. They're not going to be able to pay their rent and you're going to have this fund with nobody that can can pay. And that clearly hasn't been the case. And of course, we wouldn't open a fund where we thought there wouldn't be rental demand, right? Um, there's so much growth in Texas. But that, that's that been the argument. Oh, is this, you know, watch out to real estate investors. There's a recession coming. Jobs will be lost. You won't, your tenants won't pay. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? I think we should probably <laughs> shut YouTube down forever. Um, <laughs> it, it, it does provide some useful benefits to society, but there are so many snake oil salesmen out there uh, predicting, you know, that, that there's going to be a huge, huge wave of unemployment. So renters are going to go bankrupt. So the housing market is going to crash and we're going to see prices drop 30, 40, 50 percent. going to be a foreclosure tsunami. And it's all it's all garbage um, the, the uh, you're smart. You know how this works. Um, what I tell investors consistently is ignore the national numbers or, <laughs> or just kind of put them in the back burner, know that they're there. But look at your local market. Look at the markets where you're investing. And if you see job growth and wage growth and population growth, you're probably going to be looking at a pretty healthy local market. If you see jobs leaving and people leaving and, and wages flatlining, it's probably not going to be a really good market. So, you know, know your local market, do your homework, get educated on that. Um, but there, there is no home price crash coming. There's not enough supply uh, to meet demand. We're not going to have a lot of, of uh, homes being listed for sale until we see mortgage rates down in the low fives because current homeowners simply can't afford to trade their two and a half percent mortgage for a six and a half percent mortgage. They're not being picky. It's math. They can't afford to double or triple their monthly home payments for a smaller so, house. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and yeah, exactly right. So it's it's uh, it's going to be a couple of years protected like that. But the other thing is you're in a really interesting niche. Um, there were about a million apartment units that came online in the last year or were scheduled to come online. So in the apartment market, we've actually seen rents come down dramatically from from where they were a year ago, asking rents, uh, and actually go negative in some markets. But in the single family rental market, those those homes that are being rented out, we've actually seen uh, the the rent asking rent stabilize. Uh, they've been up two and a half, three percent nationally uh, all year and, and better in some markets. So you have a lot of people that would be home buyers right now. They want to live in a home, uh, can't afford to because interest rates and home prices are too high. Um, they probably like to rent a house rather than rent an apartment. So I think I think you and your investors are in a a really good niche, at least for the next few years. Well, it's it's been amazing. We haven't had competition on the buy side because we're we don't have the investor competition or the first time home buyer competition. Right. A lot of the homes we're buying wouldn't meet lending standards anyway because yes. they need repair. Right. Uh, so we're fixing up those neighborhoods, and the projections are coming in way better than expected. Rents coming in higher. Uh, so yeah, it just it just made sense to me. Uh, and if anyone's interested in finding out more, that's at growdevelopments.com. That's my syndication company, growdevelopments.com. You can find out that fund closes out uh, February 11th. So check it out before it's shut down or not shut down, closed, closed to investment. All right. Um, you packed in so many things in that last, uh, that last sentence. So I want to say, Yes. Yes to all of it. Job growth, population growth, infrastructure growth, wage growth. Where are the areas where you're seeing that? Uh, Primarily, we're seeing that in the South and Southeast, but maybe surprisingly, maybe not uh, because you follow this pretty closely. We're starting to see a lot of activity in the Midwest as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. Not so much states like Illinois, which which tend to be high price, high tax states, uh, but Indiana. um, Mm -hmm. Um, um, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, so, you know, a number of other Ohio uh, is doing really well. Uh, and there's some hidden gems in Ohio, like Columbus, uh, which yeah. has kind of been a hidden great housing market for the last few years. Um, home of uh, the Ohio State University, the, the only university, I think, in the country that starts with a participle. Um <laughs> But, but uh, you know, also, you know, a lot of medical uh, work going on in Columbus and Intel just announced uh, last year they're, they're creating a, a fabrication plant for their, their semiconductors there. So, you know, you have to look for some of these markets that are kind of off the national radar. 
Uh, but but again, south, you're in Texas, so you know that southeast. Um, but, you know, it's, the other interesting thing is we're, we're even seeing some kind of micro market migration that might surprise people a little bit. Say it's not a one size fits all kind of equation. We're still seeing a lot of people moving out of high price, high cost markets. They're either moving into lower cost markets in the state or they're moving into lower cost states. Not as much as the beginning stages of COVID, but still happening. And if you look at Florida, it's kind of a microcosm of the whole country. People moving out of South Florida, where it's kind of expensive and crazy. Uh, the rest of the state is is kind of lit up like a Christmas tree if if you if you're if you're color coding your map. Uh, Central <laughs> Florida, Northern Florida, tons of people moving in, both from out of state, uh, moving up from the south. So you know it, it's again really critical to know your local market. You are speaking my language. Those are all the markets that we promote at Real Wealth, as you know, and have been for years. They've been all of those markets have been on a growth trajectory for a decade, if mm-hmm. not longer. I mean, we started investing in, in Dallas, Texas in 2004 when there was already, you know, so, so many tax credits to businesses moving yep. there. Other states have seen the success of Texas and, and are following suit. Unfortunately, my state's not perhaps. But uh-huh. uh, yeah, it's just got accelerated. A lot of what the trends that were already in play, right, seems like they accelerated over this COVID pandemic period. Well, if people are moving into the state, they need somewhere to live. Uh, and, you know, states understand the long-term value of that population growth. These are states that historically haven't maybe seen that kind of population growth. So they're they're accommodating. Uh, and, and that's very, very different than what you get in states like New York and California and Illinois, who are just ridiculously anti-landlord uh, kind of states. Um and 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 then you know complain about lack of lack of affordable housing. Go figure. Um, but but yeah, so those states, South Carolina, right now is going crazy. Uh, a lot yeah. of population growth, uh, a lot of of property growth and, and development going on there. And by the way, that's the other thing we, we didn't talk about. But we're we're seeing the home builders um, start to get serious about meeting some of these inventory needs. So uh, while the headlines will tell you that housing starts are down year over year. Uh, the subtext will tell you that single family owner occupied housing starts are actually up pretty significantly year over year. What's down is development of multifamily units. And that's because there was a record number of those uh, being built or coming to market in the last year. So uh, there, there should be more inventory as we go through this year. Interest rates, mortgage rates should be coming down as we go through this year. Um, but it's going to take a while for the market to normalize. And in the interim, there's probably 20 million potential buyers out there who are, are now looking for a place to rent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what a lot of people don't see is that the distress that happened in 2008 with homeowners was due to bad loans that adjusted yeah. adjustable rate mortgages. We're seeing that in commercial real estate today. Uh, when, when your payment changes dramatically and you can't make that payment, that's, that's problematic. Yep. That's not the issue with today's homeowners. Homeowners are in the best position they've ever been in, right? There, there's some very lim- limited distress. And you would know you worked in the fo- foreclosure world for a long time and just not not seeing foreclosures increase over the past decade, right? None of the dynamics that led to the meltdown in 2008 are in place today. The only thing people who talk about this are pointing at is the the relatively rapid increase in home prices. Uh, and that was facilitated this time by two metrics that didn't exist back then. Uh, one is we had a demographic tailwind that, by the way, still exists. Largest cohort of young adults between the ages of 25 and 34 in the history of the country. They all need to live somewhere. They overwhelmingly prefer to live indoors. Uh, so they're, they're looking for a place to buy or a place to rent if they can't afford something to buy. So there was, there was that, demographics. The other is we had mortgage rates at 2.5%. So you could afford to buy a much more expensive house because your finance charges were two and a half percent at a time when inflation was at six or seven percent. So, I mean, your your payments were were actually less than the rate of inflation. Um, And now you're 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 kind of locked into that fixed rate for 30 years. and You're not going to move unless you have to. What triggered the, the default tsunami last time was was two things. You talked about one really, really bad lending. Uh, We had 15 million adjustable rate loans, basically all resetting at the same time. Overwhelming majority of those loans never should have been issued to the borrowers. The borrowers weren't even remotely qualified to handle those loans, and they only got into them because of teaser rates, which, by the way, lenders are no longer allowed to offer. 
um, for, for, for the reasons that, that we just talked about. Um, and, and so you had that, but you also had a 13 month supply of homes available for sale. And, and nobody talks about that. Normally you want to see about a six month supply. So leading into the crisis, we had a, a huge oversupply of homes available for sale. And when 15 million people started to default on their loans and go into foreclosure, suddenly you had a bunch of those properties coming onto the market at distress pricing. Uh, and, and the stilts just got knocked out from under that, that whole house of cards to mix metaphors really badly. Um, <laughs> you, you don't have that today. Uh, 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 foreclosure activity last year went up by about 10% from the previous year, but it's still almost 30% lower than it was back in 2019. And 2019 wasn't a particularly big year for foreclosures. So I'm forecasting we'll probably see another roughly 10% increase in foreclosure activity this year. But a lot of it's going to be that first notice of foreclosures. And your your investors should know that if they're looking to buy distressed properties, they need to reach out to that distressed homeowner early in the foreclosure process and buy the house directly from them rather than waiting for the auction, rather than waiting for the bank to repossess the property, because about 65% of distressed sales right now are the owner of the property selling it before the foreclosure sale. Uh, they, they, 80% of them have more than 20% equity in their homes. And they're trying to protect that. So very, a completely, completely different set of economic uh, metrics that you would look at uh, this time than what we saw in 2008. Thank you for clearing that up because, you know, I still see in the comments and it's usually from people who just don't have a background in real estate and are just basing the idea that, that prices went up, they have to come down. You know, it yep. just doesn't work that way. No. It's like if there's demand for something and there's not enough of it and people really need it, like housing, how are prices going to go down in that environment? They, they don't. And and it's, look, I, I, I desperately need new hobbies, but I did, I, I was online doing some research on home prices over the last hundred years. <laughs> you know what? Don't feel bad. I do the same thing. I, I, I get so you. I got it. In the last hundred years, do you know how many times home prices have fallen by 20%? Oh, wow. I clearly didn't get it. I, I never. Once. Once. And that was during the Great Recession back in 2008. Okay. And that was the one time that housing actually took the economy into a recession. Usually housing helps the economy get out of a recession. And by the way, the new home sales last year were so strong, relatively speaking, that they helped the economy avoid a recession. Because when you buy a new house, you buy a whole bunch of stuff to go in it, and, and they have a, a material effect on the economy. But, you know, home prices don't always go up. That, that's also wrong. And, and, and over time, if you look at the 100 years, it kind of curves up and to the right. Uh, but it's in a sawtooth manner. So sometimes it goes down a little bit. Sometimes it goes up a little bit. But over time, the, the kind of accretive value goes, goes up over, over the years. Um, so, uh, again, that, that one time in the last 100 years we saw that kind of drop off was the aberration, not the rule. It was the exception. And, uh, again, the, the over, unless there is some sort of global economic meltdown that we're not looking at right now, um, there's no reason to predict that home prices will come back down. The most likely scenario is something like what we saw in the, the mid eighties or early nineties, where you have a few years in a row where it, the, the basically prices in the housing market kind of normalize um, because they did go up so high and then interest rates went up so high and affordability became an issue. So it, it left to its own devices. The housing market will kind of reset over the next two to three years and what that means we're in store for for the next two or three years is kind of boring numbers. Um, home price, home sales volume will go up just a little bit. Home prices will go up just a little bit, um, but it, it won't be anything particularly exciting. Unless you're in, a, in an exciting market, mm -hmm. yep. you know, if there's if there's something new and exciting happening, and that's that's kind of my thing. I like to not go into boring markets or go into boring markets that are on the uh, are poised for. Fine. Yep. excitement, <laughs> you know, something new and exciting. And that's why in North Texas and our fund there, we we know that there's reshoring of chip manufacturing and billions and billions of dollars pouring into that little tiny town uh, where we're investing. So that's new and exciting, right? And and I can't imagine home prices wouldn't go up under that environment with new freeways, yep. new schools, new businesses, new high-end, high-paid jobs and so forth. Well, so there's always and, and, pockets. 
And you just talked about the whole supply chain there. So it's not just that there is you know, chip manufacturing coming into the region, which will create new jobs. All that infrastructure, all that home building, uh, all of those retail services and businesses that pop up in the area to support the people that are now working there, those all create jobs too. So it, it yeah. really kind of does have that force multiplying effect. Uh, and, and so you look for a market like that. Uh, where there's now a stake in the ground because you know there's going to be manufacturing jobs coming in in a big way, um, and they have to be distributed somehow, and those people have to be fed and housed and clothed, uh, and it really it, it does get exciting. You ought to rename your fund, you know, the Excitement Fund. I think that Excitement that's really Fund. Right. Oh yeah, not not just boring old North Texas. <laughs> All right, again, that's at GrowDevelopments.com if you're interested. Oh Rick, it's always so fun to have you here. I wish we could talk forever, but we'll just have to have you back. How can people find out more about you and where to find you? You can certainly follow me on on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, just my name, Rick Sharga. Also, have a company website, cjpatrick.com, and uh, happy to, to connect with people on LinkedIn. They just tell me that uh, they're friends of Kathy. Uh, I, I get a lot of really weird requests to connect with people on LinkedIn. And I just want to make sure you're not a Russian bot. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Rick, thank you so much. It's always Thanks, a pleasure. Kathy. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you want to find out more about our single family rental fund and invest in it, you have until actually February 9th because the 11th is a Sunday and it is for accredited investors only. You can find out what all that means at growdevelopments.com. And also, if you want to find out how to build your own portfolio, the fund is more passive, 100% passive, but also investing in new homes is pretty passive. And you can do that in all of the markets that we talked about today. Uh, by going to realwellshow.com and just click on the invest tab. We've negotiated with lots of builders around the country to lower interest rates for our buyers and also lower prices. So uh, we're actually seeing pretty good cash flow because by the way, insurance rates are much lower on new homes. Uh, So we're actually seeing pretty good cash flow in these hot growing markets. So again, you can find out more at realwealthshow.com. And thanks again for joining me here today. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.